Welcome back to JNS Outdoors, guys. I'm in Broughton, outside a pub called Tally Ho. An hour early for my Wild Ways bushcraft course. So I'm gonna grab something to eat and a Pepsi before I head down there. See you in a bit. Right, well, had no joy at the, uh, the Tally Ho. They didn't do food till six, so I've been driving around for 20 minutes. I've had to come to Lockerly stores because all the pubs that I Googled and went to locked down, like shut down, no longer pubs, their houses. We're not doing food till six and I've got to be at the course by six. So it's now half five. I can't, I'll just have to come in the stores that I just drove past. And uh, right behind me there, yeah. And uh, see if they've got a sandwich or something, it's ridiculous. But um, there ain't gonna be a lot of talking through this one. It's just gonna be mainly watching the demonstrations, what's going on in the course. Give you a lot a little bit of an idea of uh, what the course is like. And if anyone's wanting to go, they can watch this video and know what to expect. So for me, it's tally ho. Okay. Um, so if you if you gather around a little bit, I remember what I said about opting out. It's entirely up to you guys. Um, so what we're going to do is take everything throughout this weekend from a sort of bushcraft perspective. Okay. So we're not we're not about survival and drinking your own piss and killing your mates and roasting them and all that sort of stuff. That's what I signed up to. That's <laughs> what you signed up to. Go speak the crow. Yeah. Um, this is all about utilising everything we can. Okay, making ourselves as comfortable as possible um, and not, you know, um, and being about putting ourselves in situations where we want to be. So that'll be the running theme. Okay? Um, so that being said, we're going to take uh, these, game, these birds and prepare them from the point of acquisition. So the point we've got hold of them, essentially. Um, so for those of you that are wondering what these might be, they're pheasants. Okay, the ones, with the, the really sort of pretty ones there, they're the males, the really bland Brown. <laughs> They're the females. Um, but yeah, just slightly. Oh, there we go. Lay it on the back, and using your thumbs, you'll find a breastbone. Okay, if that doesn't work, that breastbone is just a central ridge. All you're going to do is pull the feathers back to reveal the flesh. Like that. That will get rid of all the feathers. And then we take our knife. And very gently just score down the skin because the sides of the meat off the bone. I don't know, you're not there yet. All right, all right. Normally, depending on how twisted the group is, <laughs> depends on whether that gets a laugh or not. <laughs> but you've just seen me rip a bird to bits with my bare hands, so I'm going to let you off a little bit. And always everyone's pitch for the night and camp. I'm gonna go and eat the pheasant that we uh, all breasted earlier. Lovely job. So we just go on a lot of walks and take pictures of whatever we see, but really, whether it's people or buildings or you know parks and things like that. So. Just a bit of fun really, but I'm trying to start taking a bit more seriously. It's good. I do enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. I do enjoy it. Relax. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things I find more than a lot of other ways. When you sort of collect those roots, if you go over into the evergreen sort of area and you start sort of digging, digging for roots, you can find these sort of like really long roots, but you need to remove the bark from them so that you can split them down into sort of like usable cord. And it's really easy, it's really handy if you've got this kind of pointed sort of like edge at the top, flat edge with a V coming out. What you do is you sort of put the root inside the V and you literally draw this along it and it, it just removes the out, outer bark for you. And then you've got sort of workable cordage immediately. So they're quite cool, they're quite cool to make. I enjoy making them, hopefully you will. Um, I'll show you just a few cuts on this pole and then I'll let you crack on and I'll help you sort of a third of the way and then I'm going to do a flat up to that point point. and then what you can do is you put your knife in 
if you think think about my straw description, the knife's gone in through the first sort of like few layers of straws, and then all I'm going to do is tilt it up and under it, and then push along. And then there's my mega long pot hanger. And everyone else practicing. material okay to uh, to show you what we've got I've got a variety of different raw materials and something I've made out of those raw materials to give you some sort of idea of what start and finish looks like um, so I'll just pass them around just pass them around and then um, Stu if you could just leave them on the sure. just bench somewhere like that. so the first stuff that's gonna come around is basically spruce root um, this stuff um, you find just under the surface of the ground um, near spruce trees. <laughs> Funny enough, um, you take, you dig it up, you follow the roots, um, dig it up, cut it off, and then peel the outer bark. You've got to peel the outer bark, otherwise it becomes really brittle. Cut, roll it up, and then it'll set like that. Now, when we want to use it, we just drop it in hot water, and it goes super pliable again. Okay, so what we're going to do to start with is with our bit of material, we're going to fold it into thirds. So two thirds and one third. Yeah, so we've got a long bit and a short bit. This section here is going to be one end of our string. Okay, so this is going to end up being one end. Right? What we do, once we fold it in half, we grab hold of the left and the right bit, and what we're going to twist both of them up. So all I'm doing is twisting the material in opposite directions. So I'm twisting away from me and I'm twisting towards me. At some point, when the tension is enough, it's going to kick like that. It does that naturally. Everybody see that right? Yeah? It's going to do that. That is now the one end of your string. Yeah? And then all you do is carry on twisting. But because you've twisted it in opposite directions and it's kinked, you're now twisting in the same direction. Okay, and then it kinks again. So you make one nice and tight, you make another nice and tight, twist, and then it kinks again. Pretty well. And they're just as good at chopping a tree down as they are with splitting logs. How often would, would you have to sharpen the blade like the edge? Depends. What you like with your tools, your really? Um, <laughs> if you want to keep it, if you want to keep it as a, if it's only ever going to split, yeah, it doesn't matter too much. Sharp, I mean, mine's in the right state. Mm. But if you want to do anything other than split with it, you know, you need to keep it sharp. Yeah. There you go. That's a that's the one. And now this is the key with that is try not to go forward. Try and go straight down with it. Keep keep that, and it'll either come off or it'll split. Yeah, now hold the axe steady and just uh, hand way down the stick, hand all the way back down the bottom of the stick, all the way back down, and just leave with the stick, that's it. If I can't get my hand around it, can I just hit it together? <clears throat> yeah, if you will. Normally, bringing them up independently, if they're not like that, actually can go like that. So if you can, great, but it, more often than not, it doesn't work. Preparing sort of like the food away from the camp so that we don't, don't obviously um, attract any animals or sort of insects and things to camp. And then we're, we're sort of like ready to prepare. Um, at this point, I swap my knives. So sort of like those of you that bought your own knives, or carbon steel ones, um, I always have sort of like one of these Mora knives sort of like in my pack anyway with stainless steel. See now. Um, the benefit of the carbon steel knives are they're much easier to maintain and, and, and sharpen. They lose their edge a lot quicker, but they're easier to sharpen in the field. Whereas the stainless steel knives, they stay sharp for longer, but they're a lot harder to sharpen. So sort of like um, more often than not, you'll see most of us with the carbon steel knives. But as soon as I get start getting anywhere near sort of like any animals or any kind of um, animal prep or anything, I immediately revert to my stainless steel knife. Because A, the edge on it, knives don't like bone. So if you hit some of the bone in this fish, it will start to potentially dull your, your blade. And mm -hmm. as I've mentioned, stainless is a, is a bit harder, um, but also you're gonna to wanna to wash the knife afterwards. 
and if you're in this kind of environment like today it's just wet and horrible you'll start to sort of like see your um, the steel start to degrade and you'll start to see it, it rust so I always keep two types of knife with me roughly somewhere just about here behind the behind the, uh, the skull or behind the skull of the fish and I'm just gonna Do the same at the back, just about here. Yeah, about there. And then I'm just going to cut down the edge. This can sometimes be the tricky bit. One thing you need to do is you want to remove these spines or these bones. So if you sort of get your thumb, I tend to work from the back, but other people work from the front and you just sort of work your way along and you'll start to sort of pull them out you can see what I'm doing mm -hmm. and you do that both sides and then you can feel you'll be able to feel if there's any bones left in there I'll just do this the other side try not to go too deep because you don't want to spoil any of the flesh of the fish you just literally just want to get under those. Literally, I'm gonna in in a second. We're all gonna just take the legs out, just okay. like you would yeah. a, with a baby grow. Yeah. So the reason you're doing it this way, because there are many ways to do it. Mm -hmm. is I think John says you want to keep the. You want to keep the skin intact. Whole. Exactly. And is then, he doing something with that? Or? Yeah. So sort of like once you've got it, you then cure it, and you could make gloves, hats. Is that what you do <laughs> here, or are you selling it on someone? We do it here. Oh, right. um, or likely we'll just chuck these away. So sort of like if you want them, you can have them. But sort of. <laughs> Oh, that just Go for a chat. Like yeah. You should do that too. Yeah. Oh god. Right then. You the other one. Yeah, near that one, didn't they? Right. So you do the legs backwards? Yes, yeah, so yeah. back back feet, front feet. Uh, and just turn them, turn them inside on themselves. Down. Okay. To the hip hip joint here, so it's, it's this piece you're removing. What, to the yeah. side of the spine? Yes, either side. Either side. So cut down this there, the worst bit, yeah. down. Sometimes once Chicken I've cut feet. down really the spine, annoying, yeah. you sort of go in nice and deep, you'll be able to see the line here, and then it's sometimes easier to work from the inside. Okay. But of course you've got the sort of hip joints here, and that's where you... Yeah, you never know, it gets covered up that way. Yeah. Um, there's another fungus called, um, I've got one here, birch polypore. Same sort of shape, but it's white. Um, it grows on birch trees. You'll see some of probably more tomorrow. You can do the same sort of thing with it and get something that will kind of do the same job. It's, it's not on the same level as that for how good it is, but it, you can do it. Um, but yeah, that stuff is incredible. And you know, that piece there would last you for a long, long time. You're not using that in one go, obviously. You'll be just taking a tiny bit off. Because the idea with the tinder is tinder's generally a little bit hard to get hold of and you need to keep it dry. So you're using it very sparingly and you're, you're getting a an ember on a little bit and then you're turning that ember into a flame using stuff that's easy to get hay for example um not where my other hand is i'm going to start doing circles and when i get deeper in there i'm going to start lowering the knife as i scrape and see what's happening now what you got to watch don't go any lower than sort of 45 degrees because if you go like that you can slip out like that so be careful and then try on another bit. And again, the more the merrier. Try not to knock it onto the floor. Now, I don't want to waste this fat wood, it's precious stuff. So. And this is the equivalent of the birch dust and our birch strips. It's worth noting that um, fatwood and the birch are the only of those tinders we've just talked about, all the fungusy ones. These are the only ones that will give us flame. Those fungus will give us embers. We then need to add some hay into the mix and blow those into flame, you know, the classic. But these will get flame. Okay, so I've got my dust there. 
and I'm look, I'm all prepped, I'm all ready. I'm not lighting that tinder until I know I've got everything ready, laid out, I'm all set, because timing is key as well. Um, keep, leave it long, leave it in long sticks, and it allows you to do, I just did hold it, gently place it over the fire without burning your hands off. You can see that fat wood is just nuts. So, that's the fat wood more than those sticks really. But what I'm looking for now, essentially, is as soon as though that bundle of sticks is kind of properly caught, so I can I can still see at the moment, that's mostly the tinder burning, mm. that fat wood. To be honest, fat wood makes it fairly easy, but once I'm confident those sticks are alight, and the flames have come up through the sticks, ignore that bit there for now. You see here, the flames are lit and they're coming up through. As soon as the flames are coming up through the middle of my tinder bundle, I'm gonna get the next bundle, the whole lot, I'm gonna put it on like that. Place it on a whole lot in one go. Don't put one stick on at a time because all you're doing is wasting time and energy. It's just burning away, just get them on. And like I said, if, you're, if they're dry, it will work. Now you can see they're obviously a bit damp inside because the amount of smoke coming off. But hopefully, they're not so, there's enough energy in the tinder to dry them out and ignite them. It's that trade-off, if they're too wet, it won't be able to do it. So we'll just keep an eye. No panic, no blowing. If you've done this and then nothing's happening and you're having to go, something's probably wrong. Because the thing is with the tinder, when it's really small, if you blow it, you'll just blow it out. And then again, once I'm confident that lot's gonna get the final bundle and cross again. And the reason we, we cross it over like that is it's just more stable and it will burn, what will happen is it'll burn a hole through the middle and we gather up those burnt ends and that's our kind of next refuel. Use the fine side because again, don't let the tool get in that much of a state. And all you do is you get the puck, place it roughly on the bevel as best you can, and move the puck around in a circular motion. <coughs> And you're kind of listening to the tone and the pitch of the axe. So the finer the pitch, higher the pitch, the sharper it is. So you can see or hear in that corner, it's quite blunt. I go into the center and it's a little bit higher kill them and it has to be a proper rolling boil a bit like when you hear the kettle just about to click off it needs to be at that point and then you start for three minutes mm. and the reason it's it's three minutes <clears throat> is um, you never quite know at what altitude you are so water boils at 100 degrees at sea level and then the higher you go the lower the temperature gets so if you're at sort of 5,000 feet it's about 96 degrees that it will boil so you need to boil it for longer because it's not yeah. got to that 100 degrees yet so the assumption is that if you boil it for three minutes whatever altitude you're at that's going to be enough to sort of like kill the bacteria and the viruses the turbidity is um, something that you're going to need to filter out and I've got a couple of things here which I'll, I'll show you in a second um, because if you can take the mud out you can then boil the water it's then set potentially safe to drink. The only, other, the only other contaminant which was the chemicals and heavy metals, are those are things that you need to be con consider if you're sort of like near farmland or near sort of like industrial works or something like that. Obviously that was three lessons. Have you set up that nav? Good luck with that. <laughs> right then, um, so this session, ladies and gents, is on traps and snares. So procuring 
protein in the form of animals, all right? Um, some of the traps I'm gonna show you are illegal to use in the UK, all right? We show you them because they're cool. <laughs> and and it's, bush, it's, a, it's a good bushcrafty project, like making a figure four deadfall is quite good carving projects and all that sort of stuff. Um, but they are in the UK illegal. If you go to other countries, they might be legal. I mean, America and Canada, you can pretty much do what you want to. Um, but yeah, some of them are, and I'll explain why they are. But essentially, um, traps kill in four ways. All right, they either dangle, tangle, mangle, or strangle. So we've got the four angles covered, all right? <laughs> dangle, tangle, mangle, strangle. You look horrified. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that animal. Um, so you can't go out and set loads of rabbit snares and surreptitiously turn one the wrong way around to try and catch a try and catch a deer. All right, yeah, they have to be prey specific. Um, what we've done is simulate an animal run. There's no point just going out and putting snares anywhere. They need you need to identify the track yeah. of where they're going. Um, so. The animal comes along, it gets to a critical point, holding a hedge, holding a fence. Um, let's say we're going for rabbit. Rabbits, if you watch their behavior, will skip along the ground. They'll get up on the hind legs, have a little sniff, have a little listen. And then through that critical point, they'll, they'll go and get through it, all right? We want to catch them at their maximum point of panic, all right? Where they're, they're stressed out and they're just concentrating on getting them through. Um, so roughly, Four fingers off the ground. It has to be a free running snare. In Scotland, they need to have a thing called a deer stop, which is essentially a little nut and bolt there um, to stop that getting caught round the animal's hoof. Um, you need, again, you need landowner's permission um, and it's for like rabbit control. Okay, so, um, that's just a riser that holds the snare in place and that's a stake that gets driven into the ground. Happy with those. This then is a bushcraft version. So this is deer sinew from an animal, from a, from a deer's back, um, twisted into cord, as you all can do now. Um, and then it's free running, um, and then you just use some sinew to tie it onto the stake. That is illegal to use, okay? Um, because it's not brass wire not got the, the brass wire so what they don't want is an animal being caught in here it, a rabbit would just chew for it but they don't want that animal running off into the wild with a makeshift dog lead around its neck because it will strangle it as soon as the animal on that this is a, a dangle snare trap okay so this is a strangle trap it's just a tent peg driven into the ground with another tent peg <coughs> turned upside down. Yeah? Um, a bit of, I'll show you in a sec. There's a bit of string under a branch under tension, all right? You set the trap on the animal trail, again at head height. The animal comes along. This is obviously be free running, but I've made it so it guaranteed it can't catch anything. Animal comes along, puts his head through, bounces up and down. Little Peter Rabbit does the jigger death. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. We'll start with some fishing stuff. Um, so, laws with fishing in the UK. In fresh water, in a river, someone will own that fishing right. All right, so you need to get permission. And um, you need to use a rod and a reel, otherwise the world explodes. Um, in a marine environment, you've got a lot more scope and freedom. Okay, so in a saltwater environment at the sea, you can go spear fishing. Um, you can set traps. Uh, you can put gill nets out. All that, all that sort of stuff. So if I show you some primitive spear fishing stuff first, so stuff like this. So we've got a hazel stick that's been split, uh, battened down the centre, and then battened down the centre again. Yeah? 
and space it out with air and then fire harden so harden just rub the tip from the fire to force out the moisture um, and then we sit there or stand there in the shallows watching the little fishies and the flatties come by and then whack, put it over your shoulder walk up the beach scaring all the tourists from Birmingham um, all this stuff like that which is a little bit more intricate um, again just a split stick with a wedge holding them open um, some natural cord um, some an <laughs> antler tipped prongs so the fish can go in but not out all right um, held in with some primitive glue pitch, made out of pine resin and beeswax so that's to give you some ideas about like what you can make in the woods using not very many tools. Um, Find your way. The first one, normally, if it was a nice sunny day, I would have taken you out onto the big field to show you this. Um, but this is uh, the shadow stick. Has anyone heard of this yeah. sort of process before? So what, what you would do in, in order to, to use this, <coughs> this is going to help us find our east-west line so that we know where north-south is. Um, and what you would do is you find a nice open spot somewhere in the sunshine and you put this stick in the ground, the, the, tall of the, the tall of the three sticks, and wherever the shadow ends is where you put the shorter one. And this is known as our westerly point. So the sun comes up in the east and it travels across the sky into the west where it sets. And so the shadow would be coming from an east to westerly direction. So that's why it's known as our west point. And then if you do this sort of like early in the morning, you're going to get a nice long shadow. So your stick might be all the way over here because the sun is really low to the horizon. Mm. So it casts that long shadow. And then as it comes up over the sky, what will happen is the shadow will obviously move, but it will also shorten as it yeah. gets nearer and nearer midday. And then it will get longer and longer again in the other direction as we go more and more sort of like westerly. So what you do is you put the long one in, exactly where the shadow ends and then you sort of wait and you can wait sort of 15 20 minutes and it will have moved enough for you to then put your second stick in where the next shadow is the longer the longer you leave it obviously the more that the shadow is going to move because of the sun's movement in the sky and the more easier it is to actually sort of like see truly where this east westerly direction is so we've got our west point as the sun moves, it moves the shadow, and then we stick another stick in where the shadow has moved to after that sort of 20 minute, sort of 30 minute period, and that's known as our easterly point. So that's west, that's east. If I stand here, I know that's north and that's south. And it doesn't matter sort of like what time of day you do this, because whenever you put the first stick in, the sun is always moving east to west. So if you did it in the morning or in the afternoon, the sun will always move more westerly than its position when you first put that first peg in. So sometimes we get questions of, well, what happens in the afternoon? And it's exactly the same. You could put this in at two o'clock in the afternoon and at four o'clock in the afternoon, it will have still moved, the sun will still move more westerly. So it will have done the same, same type of thing to the shadow. All that changes is potentially the length of the shadow They'll either be longer or shorter, dependent on the sort of the, the time of day. But it's it's really really accurate. Um, but obviously only works if the sun's out. Does that make if in doubt move out? Right. Number two is medicines. So if you're on any medicine, um, prescribed or otherwise, um, just be aware that there's chemical constituents in the plants, just like there is in normal food, that can react with your medicine, make it do more than it should, or make it not work. So for argument's sake, um, I am on PTSD medication. Um, I can't eat grapefruit, otherwise it sends the meds crazy. I haven't tried, <laughs> I've got enough shit going on up there without worrying about um, grapefruit. So yeah, so um, just be aware that that is the same within wild food, okay? So identification, medication, this is common sense. If you've never tried something before, um, make sure you do it with someone else because you may be allergic to that thing, mm. all right? So what I would say is sort of best practice, if you're trying wild food for the first time, get some, eat some with, you've like positive ID'd it, yeah, that's, that's wood sorrel, no, it's wood sorrel. 
eat it with someone else, all right? Have a little bit left, because if your face suddenly swells up and you start to grow another leg, you can go to the ambulance service, I've eaten this, wood soul. <coughs> they have a poisons database where they'll go, yeah, it's probably allergic to that chemical, all right? You can rub it on your skin. Yeah, yeah there's lots of stuff it on your lip, on your lip and there. slowly stuff. There's loads of that sort of stuff. Um, but if I wasn't 100% sure what it was, I wouldn't be rubbing it on my skin and doing little <laughs> testers. Um, but you're absolutely right. Well, for allergies. Oh, for allergies. Ah, yeah, yeah, for yeah. allergies. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, identification medication allergies. Um, minors. So if you're foraging for kids, they're, they're essentially their portion size is their hand, their palm, to give you some idea. Again, going back to wood sorrel, because it's mega. Um, it tastes absolutely beautiful. If you have more than a handful of it, it's probably going to give you diarrhea. Okay, so just because it's edible doesn't mean you can eat loads of it. Um, identification medication allergies, minors. So safe sourcing, <coughs> making sure where you get those things from are nice and safe. Um, are you all right? <laughs> oh, that is pretty grim. Is it a new one or an old Slug one? Slug um, Yeah, so where you get it from. So what we would say <laughs> as sort of... <laughs> Common sense. <laughs> That's never happened before. Um, <laughs> is uh, not on well-worn tracks, okay? If you're on a well-worn track, anything above dog head height is normally good, all right, for obvious reasons. <coughs> um, um, yeah, the people say not by the sides of roads, from the hedges. That's mainly because of the traffic, really. Um, the plant could absorb the toxins. I think it's pretty unlikely, but... There is that thought process out there. Um, uh, and yeah, and bear in mind what you can eat in abundance doesn't necessarily mean what someone else can eat. All right, so it's, those are the sort of things. But the key one is identification.